What's up everybody and welcome to the channel Flash 001 USA. Today is Sunday, it's October 31st, the year is 2021 and it's right around 5 p.m. here. Now this is going to be sort of a follow-up video to one that I had uploaded about four years ago. Originally when I set this shop up it was my intentions to do an addition to the building at which point I wanted to install an emergency power backup system and I did all of that. The original system consisted of a hefty 12 volt battery bank along with a pure sine wave inverter and a smart charger that kept that battery bank topped off from the shore power or from the house power. It worked really good. There was quite a few times when we lost power out here to storms and it kept us right on moving with it. And I've actually got videos loaded up on the channel where I'm showing you guys when the power goes out here where I've used the backup system and I gotta tell you it's been a saving grace quite a few times. Now on my system I wasn't trying to power up the whole house what I was using it for was to keep the main things in the house going such as the refrigerator, the freezer along with a handful of lights and of course the entertainment system so that I felt like I was in the 21st century. Now since then I have upgraded this system and I've moved up to a 48 volt system along with a really good inverter and I finally got around to installing my MPPT controller along with the solar panels. I actually had all that stuff four years ago and I never set it up but this year I did. I did it at the beginning of summer and it worked so well that I basically took this building off grid the whole summer. I ran my air conditioner in here, all of my test equipment including my computer along with the drill press and it came off without a niche, I noticed a major difference in my electric bill. Um, I got to where I was seeing the bell drop around where I was seeing $30 drops on it. So that was a heaven sent. Not only that, the couple of times when we lost power here during the storms, I was able to pipe the power right up to the house and keep us in the 21st century. Now the video is going to be twofold. The first thing I want to do is just quickly brush over because I don't want to be up here doing a lot of talking. I want to cover the different kinds of systems to set up and hopefully this will help you guys understand what I'm doing here and maybe make a decision, especially if you're thinking about solar. The second thing we're going to do and end it out on is we're going to go next door and we're going to look at the new system, how I have it set up. Okay, let's cover two separate systems and then we're going to look at a variation of one of those systems and you'll see what I'm talking about shortly. System one, a small system, a small power system. The pros of that, you'll have emergency power at your fingertips, something that's going to be quick, something that doesn't require you to go crank up a generator or deal with messy fuels. The cons, you're not going to be able to run anything big in your house. You're not going to be able to run anything like a heat pump or any other high power appliance. So that's your first system, pros and cons. The second system, this will be a bigger system. This will be a system for those who are wanting to completely go off grid, cut ties with the power company. Now the pros of that is, is you're living life in the high life. You've got the life of Riley, you got everything in your house, you can run it, it's just like you got power coming from the power company. The cons, you're going to have an awfully big battery bank and a lot of solar panels to do this. There's also something else that you have to take in consideration. When you calculate a system like that, you normally have to look at your battery bank, not only how much power do I need off this battery bank to run a 24 hour period, but what happens if you have a five day rainstorm that comes in and you've got nothing but overcast and those solar panels aren't producing anything. What if it's a 15 day overcast? Believe me, we've seen that kind of weather here. That's not unusual. At that point, you have to have a fallback plan. You have to have a really robust generator, something that can recharge that battery bank through the daytime and hopefully get it completely topped off and then you can run off that battery bank through the nighttime when your power demands will be low and then you rinse and repeat until the sun finally comes back out. So in other words, you're going to have a lot more money tied up into the system. You're going to have a lot more to learn to get everything functional the way it needs to be. Hint. My system here is kind of in between both of those. It's not actually going to run the house, but it can carry me through whenever I need it. 
And if it came down to extremisms, yeah, I could go completely off grid. I told you we were going to talk about a variant of one of these systems. There is another way of doing this. And this is probably the best way for the average person. They got what's called a grid tie inverter. And you hook all your solar panels to that. You hook it into your house and what it does is this thing feeds your house power. Any extra power will be fed back to the power company. Normally they will come out and they install a special meter. That way, this way they can keep up with what's going on with your power consumption and production. And that's probably for the average person the best way to do it. Because you can wind up, depending on how big you set your system up, you can wind up generating enough power where you annihilate the power bill completely or have a $5 and $10, $20 bill at the, every, at the end of every month. Now, I've got that, and I've got it ready to be installed. I'm just going to sit down and do it. And um, we'll cover that a little bit more as the video goes on. So that's your two systems right there. What I want to do now is we're going to go next door, and we're going to look at what I have set up on my small setup. I'm going to walk you through it step by step, and near the end of the video, you guys are going to see the actual power being produced, you're going to see some clouds come over, and you're going to see the power, how it does this, and you're going to understand the relationship of a battery bank and how it works with your MPPT controller so that you have power even when the clouds come up. Because on an overcast day, you can have a bright, sunny day shining down on you, and then you can have some big old clouds float over, and you can drop from uh, 1,000, 2,000 watts down to 100 watts just like that. But that's where your battery bank comes into play. All right, on that note, we'll pause out, and I'm going to walk you guys next door. Okay, let's take a look at my power room setup. And it's a small system, but for what it is, I couldn't be happier. The first thing we'll do is we'll take a flyby. I'm going to let you guys look at everything. And then we'll come back and look at everything in detail. Now this is the battery bank. And we'll cover that more in detail shortly. This is the electronics, which consists of the inverter, along with the controller for the solar. And I've got all my safety switches, and DC fuses, or some of them anyhow. And I've got a box set up here that allows me to monitor the voltage and current with old style meters. Now right now, we're running off of shore power, but we're going to go back in time here after I do this video, and we're going to let you guys see this whole system running on a sunny day, and you'll see how it works real world. So let me explain how I run this. If you notice, there's two receptacles up here. Top receptacle is the output for the inverter when I'm running it. The bottom receptacle here, this is the AC from the house for shore power. If you notice, i got two plugs on it. If you follow these, they go around to the breaker box. Now the breaker box is set up for split phase, but I'm running single phase. Keep in mind, I'm running an electronic shop and I don't have anything in there that requires 220 volts. So for now, I just tied those together. This way I have all the AC receptacles next door running. And for me, it's good enough. If I decide to ever go with a bigger system with split phase, as far as the inverter goes, I'm already set up to do it. I can change all this wire up and reconfigure it in a New York minute. And this building will then be set up at 220, but I don't need it for now. So what we're going to do right now is we're going to cover the gear out here, and then we're going to jump to the battery bank last. So this is what I've got. It's a Spartan inverter. It's 3,300 watts continuous power. It's 9,999 watts surge power. This thing will handle any inductive load or anything that has a surge current, like an air conditioner or whatever, to get it cranked up. Now this thing here uses a big transformer inside of it, but it is what it is. It's heavy. It can take a beating because it has this transformer here. And like I said, I couldn't be happier with it. Keep in mind, yes, it is a pure sine wave inverter. It also has the ability to charge the battery bank. We'll cover that in a minute here too. Now on the wall here, this is the MPPT controller. This is an Amazon special. I love this thing. I've actually got a second one as a backup unit. 
and I'm going to let you see the company. This thing's like 180, 185 bucks. Now for the one I've got, it can take 150 volts DC from the panels. It'll accept 150 volts DC in, and this thing is capable of delivering 60 amps continuous current to the battery bank. Now for now, I don't have that much solar set up. I've got enough for, um, I've got about 2,000 watts set up on the roof, and that's more than enough for my needs. I've actually got more solar panels here. Somewhere along the line, I'll add them to it, but I mean, really, I haven't needed them. During the summer months, this guy here, I was able to run the AC unit, and the battery stayed totally topped off, and this guy here carried the whole shop during work hours in the daytime, so I couldn't be happier with it. So down here, on the left, this is a breaker switch, so I can turn the solar panels off or break them out away from the controller should I need to if I got an emergency. Then I have the DC fuse right here. This is the output of the controller that goes to feed the battery bank. Now, a word to the wise. Don't let anybody tell you. Don't let Goober or Leroy or anybody like that talk you into using housebreakers when you're setting up a DC system. At best, they work half-ass and you're dealing with a fire hazard. These things are designed for DC and by God that's what you need to be using because all it takes is one screw up especially when you're dealing with the battery bank. Anybody ever drop a screwdriver across a battery? Well imagine a 48 volt system doing that or anything that goes wrong. Your building, your equipment and possibly you could go up into an ash in a New York minute. So don't let anybody tell you to sub out stuff like this right here. Use what you need to use and do it right the first time. Now on my system, I set mine up a little bit different. I've got just an old AC box and I modified it. I cut holes in it because I wanted old school meters in it. I like mechanical meters. I've also got a way of reading it digitally, but that's another story. So basically what I've got set up here is a voltmeter this side and a current meter this side. And on the inside of this box, there's my current resistor. And of course, you can see the battery bank passes through this. And that current resistor, that big thing right there, um, that's how the ammeter works. It's dropped across this, this resistor right here. And as current goes through it, it generates enough voltage to run the meter here on the left. Now, the way I got this set up is I've noticed I got a switch up here that's for this meter right here. So when I'm running off of the battery bank, I can flip the switch and I can watch the, the current real time from the battery bank to the inverter. Now, this isn't just an inverter. It's also a charger. It's a charger. It'll actually charge the battery. So if I've got one of those 15-day uh, cloudy weather days where this, where I'm concerned that the batteries aren't being totally topped off, which they're far and few and in between, but there's been occasions when I have, and I've used this guy here. So I can turn around, I can flip the switch, and now I can see the current from this guy here that's going back to the system to charge the batteries. Now the good thing about this is I also can monitor the current to make sure that nothing's getting out of hand. This thing has a variable current adjustment on it. I've got it set up, I think, around 8 or 10 amps. It's not that much. So, you know, when you're charging your batteries, you know, especially if you're not taking anything off of them, like in the daytime when I'm running the shop in here, you don't want to be cooking your battery bank with high currents. You're better off with a slow charge over a longer period of time. And between 8 to 12 amps is more than enough to get the job done, and it'll carry, and, and you'll be extremely happy with it. Also on this battery bank, if you notice, there's a wire right here. I've got a temperature sensor and what that does is senses the temperatures of the batteries because in the summer and winter months, you know, you're, as far as the demands of how the batteries need to be charged, it changes. The characteristics change so that sensor there aids in making sure the batteries are correctly charged and you want everything, you know, like I said, anything that you can do that's going to prolong the life of your equipment, you want to do that. So let's take a look at the battery bank now. Now, I am running a 48 volt system, so I've got eight 6 volt deep cycle batteries. I'm using golf cart batteries, and these things have done a mighty fine job for me. 
if you notice everything's color coded so there's the positive output notice I got positive wires jumping here of course I got a jumper here and then all black wires for jumpers and negative output right here so this is a series setup and we'll cover this a little bit more here in a second also I'm going to show you the wiring job I did here because you want to keep your job neat and clean if you're going to do it yourself notice there's another breaker right there as I said do not let anybody tell you that you can use an AC breaker do it right the first time with the correct components now I made me two steel buses that can handle a million zillion amps it's quarter inch or five sixteenths I don't know it's pretty darn thick I cut two pieces they're cut like an upside down T welded together and I got all the nuts and bolts and everything sticking on this was a place that I could turn around and mount wires run wires do whatever I needed to do and these two steel buses here allow me to tie everything together oh speaking of one little thing here there's the sensor you don't have to do anything but put it on one battery I know this thing's going out of focus but you can see the white wire here run down it's just stuck on the side of the battery and all it does is sense the temperatures of the battery okay let's get back to the program here 300 amp switch right here this will handle 300 amps for a DC circuit that's my cutoff switch or cut on switch depending on what I'm doing I think it handles if I'm not mistaken oh my god it's like some stupid amount of current that it handles as far as a, a surge current it's like 9,000 amps 13,000 amps it was like something out of cartoon land when you read the specs on it you know it was enough that uh, it would scare Superman as far as it'd be like kryptonite to him the thing can handle a massive inrush of current so that's the switch right there so this allows me to break the battery bank away everything is switched the battery bank can be disconnected from the system um, safety fuse which I can also turn just by hitting this guy here I can open it up and disconnect this guy from the battery bank charging it solar panels could be disconnected right here and you know of course we got our heavy duty wire for the inverter oh I'm gonna show you something really quick out here quick connects are a wonderful thing the solar the quick connect so I can even disconnect everything modular just as on a just a drop of a dime if I need to. Alrighty then. Uh, one thing I want to show you because I know somebody's probably wondering what the hell they're looking at here. They see these big orange caps. These were an Amazon special also. The problem is um, they didn't work the way the manufacturer wanted them to. He, the guy is doing his best to correct the problem, but if you notice, you got a plastic piece here. And a rubber ring here and you can't see it but there's a red float right here and this thing has a plunger in the bottom of it kind of like you uh, just imagine the inside of a tank of a toilet the water fills up and then you know the, it raises up and shuts the water off inside the tank well this thing here has a port here and I've got a bottle that goes with it that goes on the top of this and you can top these batteries off with the water Simply by watching this thing as you put water in it, it'll raise up and hit the, the, the key point wherever you mark it for whatever batteries you're using. And it makes the job clean, keeps you from having to pull the, the caps off and splatter acid or anything like that. And his first design gave him problems. And I, I did a video, I've worked with the guy on this, just trying to help him get it straightened out. He came up with the second one, he thought it would seal better, but you see it's two pieces. It's a white piece and then a black piece that makes the float and the problem is the acid over time seeps into the centers of these things and fills that float up and it sinks so he's coming out with a one piece unit here in the near future so you know just want to let you guys see what I was dealing with right there but um, if you were curious what those orange caps were that's what they are hopefully um, you walked away from, with this with some knowledge and you understand how and why I've got my system set up as mentioned um, my building goes off grid during the hot months I can run the AC unit I can run anything in my shop and it's knocking about 30 bucks on average off of my electric bill every month so not only that if we lose power 
due to a storm, well, I can pipe the power from here right up to the house, run the refrigerator, the freezer, a handful of lights in the house, along with the entertainment system, and I go from Flintstone era to the 21st century, just like that, by running one power cord. Eventually, I'm going to set up um, a transfer switch at the house upstairs. Okay, one more thing worth the mention here. And that is how to save yourself a lot of money when you're putting your battery bank together. I almost let this get by me. Okay, as mentioned, I built my own power buses. And that's just made out of steel right there, so you can save a lot of money doing that. But where I saved a lot of money at, and I saved some major money was, was on these jumpers right here. Of course, you got the black ones over here. If you go to buy these things from an automotive place or even a solar place that's going to sell you these jumpers, they're too damn proud of them. They want too much money for them. So here's a dirty little secret. Go to a welder's supply house. Buy a replacement welder cable. And this is heavy duty wire right here. It's real copper wire. It's not no aluminum wire that's got copper coatings on it crap. It's real copper wire. You'll need to pick up whatever length that you need, so you'll have to calculate, hey, how many jumpers do I need? What's the lengths of those jumpers? So you buy enough wire, red and black. You'll cut them. You'll turn back around, and all you do to turn it into a jumper, and I can't remember if this is half-inch copper tubing or maybe something a little bit less than that, but you go here, get your copper tubing. You measure out the lengths. And I think this is like one inch, so I cut these pieces like maybe two maybe two and a quarter inches length, I can't tell you right off the top of my head, but you um, mash one side of it flat, you drill a hole in the center of it so that it accommodates the battery terminal, and then you can run your wire into it, crimp it, which is what I did here, so I crimped it on this end, I actually soldered it just as a precaution, and then I used heat shrink tubing. Now something else that you're going to want to invest in, and you get this from any automotive store, battery terminal protector. This stuff is worth its weight in gold. And once you get everything in place and know everything's wired up the way you want it, this stuff is like a, a thin oil. You just kind of mist it over all your connectors. And what that does, the oil helps protect from any of the acid or the fumes that get onto it. keeps the corrosion down to a minimum. Hell, I've got that on the, the these guys right here too. So even my buses are protected. And this has been here for a couple of years. I have had zero point zero point zero problem with any corrosion. Now I do get in here on occasion and if I see where I like I'll give you a good example right here. I see any little acid spills because I had pulled out that plunger right there or sometimes the batteries are going to sweat a little bit. I'll get in here and I will clean things up. So you know keeping everything tidy, keeping everything neat is a must with your battery bank and that includes making sure that you're keeping these things topped off with the correct amount of water. Always use distilled water. Don't use anything else. Don't use tap water. Don't use anything that has any kind of contaminants in it because it will pretty much um, shorten the life of the battery bank, if not totally screw them up. So that's the tip for the day. All right, let's start outside with the system. We'll start with the solar panels. What I have is a total of 14 100 watt panels mounted up on the roof. I'm running two series strings of seven panels per string. What I do is I combine these two series strings in parallel when it runs into the control room where the solar controller is along with the battery bank and the inverter is. Now for some of you that may not understand what I'm saying when I say series strings, what I'm telling you is is for each string the panels are wired in series so the voltage adds up. And of course when I get down to the control room and I run both of these in parallel what I'm doing is I'm doubling the current but I'm not doubling the voltage. The voltage stays the same on each string but the current doubles. Alright, the sun is out from behind the clouds and let's take a look at our power production. Keep in mind that the way I'm running the AC, the compressor is just on non-stop to keep the shop good and cool. So, let me zoom in here. So right now, 
the panels are feeding uh, right around a thousand watts um, 18 amps and the battery bank is very well topped off right now as you can see now we're not even in the main part of the day where the solar panels are getting the full light when the sun's right over the top of them but when that happens I'll normally see anywhere between 11 to 1200 watts depending what I'm pulling in the shop now you can see we've hit a much higher power output and we got good current and the batteries are staying topped off this is what it looks like when the sun is starting to get to the point where it's actually hovering over the panels that's what I see on average right there through the most productive part of the day. Let me hit this again. Okay, this is what I expect to see when the solar panels are getting the right amount of sun or getting the full brunt of it. Not bad. You see it's bouncing a little over 1200 watts and the amperage is most excellent and the batteries are still topped off. So everything is working really good today and I'm going to try to catch it with some clouds floating in front of the sun and let you guys see how this will just all of a sudden drop down so we'll take a standby well here we go that's cloud coverage right there that's obstructing the sun but um, I'll bring the camera back and try to capture it when they get really behind the clouds and we start seeing the power take a major dip actually like it is right now that's what I wanted you to see and it'll dip all the way down to even 300 watts production so you see it going down and this is what happens all day through the day when you're dealing with cloud cover now if you're dealing with overcast weather it's pretty consistent but you just have a lower output as far as your power goes so you can see right now And we got a lot of clouds up here, so when one of these big gray ones float in front of the sun, then you see the power take a dive like that. Now, this is a cloudy day right here, so as the sun goes in and out behind the clouds, I get a major output, then I get a low output, what you just seen on the camera. But then you have a situation where it's like overcast, where you come out and the sky may be gray looking, but it's not like a heavy rainstorm gray. It's a extremely bright overcast, and when it's like that, I'm still good to go. I'm still going to be producing right around 600 watts, five to 600 watts off these panels. And that absolutely floats the shop and completely runs the AC unit and holds the battery bank in charge. So there you go. Now the sun's come back out again. We'll just take one more look at it here, but you can see it just bounces all over the place. You hear the fan kicking in? This is what you should expect out of your system. So I know some people may think you hook the solar panels up and it's a consistent power as long as the sun's hitting them and that's not necessarily the case. There's a lot of factors that play into it. All right, we're gonna take a pause here. Okay, the sun is behind some major cloud coverage right now. Let's take a look at the power production we're getting at this point in time. And you'll see how everything is affected by everything here. So we went from 1200 watts down to 175 watts. And this is where the battery bank kicks in. and it'll go up and down all day through a day like this when you got clouds that are up in the sky. They float across and block the sun out. And this is where your battery banks carry the load. So hopefully you guys are kind of getting a little bit of a picture painted about how this stuff works. As I'm aware that a lot of people, you know, that aren't familiar with this, they think, well, okay, you know, the sun shines down and it's producing power and in their minds they're probably thinking it's either at full power or no power and that's not the case. Um, it's basically, if you've got a day without clouds on it, like where I'm at, I'll give you an example. The sun starts from over here 
and it goes catty corner across my property at least at this time of the year to over here so it actually crosses over sort of sideways on my panels a little bit and on average I guess I can get about about seven hours of runtime full power with the batteries being topped off and that's not bad like at 10 o'clock in the morning when the sun's about there it's not even hitting the panels directly but I'm gonna be producing starting off around 930 on a cloud to stay that is around 400 watts and in 30 minutes I'll be up to about 500 watts which is what you know the air conditioning pulls and then I mean it's very quickly all of a sudden I'm producing power and it'll produce all day through the day and normally around 530 in the afternoon I'll shut down everything that I've got in here as far as the inverter and I'll just let the solar panels top the batteries off for the next day because by 530 I'm done in the shop I've got my cool air conditioner runtime that I needed so I'm getting around 930 10 11 12 1 2 3 4 5 about eight eight and a half hours on a summer day uh, as far as having nice air conditioning that keeps me cool so this is how it works you know you also got a plan as far as how you're going to do your work schedule if you want to take advantage of something like this but it's a small setup but it's a good setup okay let's take a look at the future grid tie system here as you can see we got boxes and boxes of solar panels and we got more solar stuff here and right here in this big box is my 5000 watt grid tie inverter yes this is UL approved and my power company will accept this when I go to set it up so I'm going to start my system off as a 3000 watt system and I will build it up and add more panels to it as I need and as I learn the system more now for mine I'm using 100 watt panels and the reason I'm doing that is they're smaller they're easier to handle and since I'm going to be the one setting it up that makes life easier you start getting into the 250 watt panels or the big panels you kind of need two people to do it correctly if not you're going to wind up breaking something if you're not real careful with these it's a nothing job the only downfall is is there's a lot more of them you got to tie in to your scaffolding versus if you got a handful of large ones you know you can set them up pretty quickly if you got two people but this is it right here I would have had all this set up this summer but thanks to the new administration and I don't know their their need to give China everything that we have all of our resources guess what guys I couldn't get metal I wanted to build metal scaffolding for this to go on and I'm not going to do this with wood this is going to be set up to stay in place even if a major storm hits it but um, the shortage of metal and the price of metal I mean it just went off the damn charts so for now this will sit here but I will get this put up one way or another by this, uh, this this coming summer so there you go just wanted to share that with everybody on that note I hope you guys have a good evening and this is the flash 001 USA channel you guys have a happy Halloween bye bye